What's up everyone? Pritch here and Guild Wars 2's third expansion, End of Dragons, is just a couple weeks away, which means new maps, new mechanics, and new stories. In this video, I want to help everyone get up to speed on the story of Guild Wars 2 leading up to End of Dragons. I have 10 years of content to go over, so let's run it. First up, we have the core game, where you begin your journey in Tyria as either a human, a fat human, a tree, a rat, or a kitty cat. Each race has a plethora of different fun backstories where your character slowly starts to become a hero and rack up a body count that would blow Legolas and Gimli out of the water. While growing in fame and reputation, you realize how big of a threat the Elder Dragons are because they cause mayhem and destruction to the world. Elder Dragons are primordial and incredibly powerful beings that feast on the magic of Tyria. Elder Dragons have a cycle that spanned millennia, and the cycle consists of first, they wake up. Second, they go around Tyria and bring destruction and death with them as they consume most of the ambient magic scattered across Tyria. Third, after they've consumed vast amounts of magic, they go into a long hibernation or slumber, and as they sleep, that ambient magic starts to seep out of them very slowly so that when they eventually wake back up, they repeat the cycle all over again. Recently, in our adventures in Guild Wars 1, the human god Abaddon was killed, and the death of this other primordial being has begun to awaken the Elder Dragons from their slumber. The Elder Dragon that we're most concerned about at the moment is Cthulhu, Hentai Dragon of Death, or Zaitan for short. Zaitan takes the dead and turns them into his minions called the Risen. Upon awakening, Zaitan raised an entire nation called Or that had sunk into the bottom of the ocean and corrupted it with his death magic. From there, he's been sending his minions and champions across Tyria to rain death and destruction, as well as find magical artifacts for Zaitan to consume. With the corruption of Zaitan spreading, you decide to meet with the big three organizations, Walmart, Amazon, and Apple. Wait, hold, wait, hold, wait, no, that's not, that's not the worst. It's, okay, here it is. Uh, the Durman Priory, the Order of Whispers, and the Vigil. It's here that you get to pick the organization you want to be a part of. The Durman Priory is for nerds that like to research or have anything higher than a bachelor's degree. The Order of Whispers are for pickpockets and thieves that enjoy subterfuge and spying. And the Vigil are for the meatheads that are here to do one thing, and that's kill everything on site. You pick your organization, do a mission for them, then attempt a second completely different avenue by attending a meeting designed to bring Destiny's Edge back together again to fight the Elder Dragons. Destiny's Edge is a group of people that used to be an elite team that would go around fighting Elder Dragon minions and champions to protect the world. Just like the modern day hiring process, Destiny's Edge promoted diversity. First is the human Logan Thackeray, who's there for his raw sex appeal. Just look at that hair. Oh. Second is the Char Ritlock Brimstone, who is just an absolute badass who uses a flaming sword. Third is the Silvari Kate, who is a total Karen and no one likes her. Fourth is the Norn Air Sturgulkin and her trusty Black Wolf Garm. Air is like an Amazonian warrior goddess and Garm is a very good boy. Fifth is the Asuran Zoja, who is the Velma of the gang. And sixth is the Asuran Snaff, who has ears and also a face. All right, now I need to give a brief history of Destiny's Edge because their adventures are brought up a lot and shed some light on things later on. Destiny's Edge was doing an amazing job of taking out Elder Dragon champions and minions. So Air decided that the group was ready to try to kill an Elder Dragon called Glint. Glint was a special and unique Elder Dragon because she was the daughter and champion of a greater Elder Dragon called Krakatoric. Krakatoric is the Elder Dragon of Purple Crystal Powers and his minions are called the Branded. So Destiny's Edge go fight Glint and get curb stomped, but they get lucky because Glint was very special. Now normally, Elder Dragon champions are heavily influenced and controlled by their Elder Dragons. However, Glint had been purified from Krakatorg's corruption by the Forgotten, who were an ancient snake people race, and were actively looking to prevent the rise of Krakatorg again. During the fight, Glint and Destiny's Edge decide that they should partner up and try to stop Krakatorg together. Glint reveals that she's taken some of Krakatorg's crystal blood, which is apparently his weakness, and they create a dragon's blood spear. 
Krokotork awakens and comes straight for Glint to kill her for the betrayal, but before the fight ensues, Pretty Boy Logan gets called away to save damsel in distress Jenna, who's the queen of the humans, because she is being attacked by Branded. Even with Logan gone, Air convinces the rest of Destiny's Edge to help Glint fight Kralkatorik. In the fight, Kralkatorik winds up killing Glint and Snaf, the Asuran that had the ears and the face. After this crushing defeat, Destiny's Edge disbanded and stopped working together since they were failures who caused the death of their friend and the only good Elder Dragon. Now, this might come as a shocker, but when you asked Destiny's Edge to get reunited because it feels so good, they said hells no. So you go back to your organization, get a mentor that you're going to get really emotionally attached to, do some missions, help some indigenous tribes of Tyria, and then BAM! It's Claw Island time. Lion's Arch is the central hub of Tyria, where people of all races gather, and defending this city from a naval attack is Claw Island. Zaitan sends undead ships full of Risen, led by one of his champions, Baby Death Dragon. And yes, you heard me correct, I said baby because this thing is tiny compared to Elder Dragons. The Risen take Claw Island and push the defenders back to Lion's Arch, and the only reason that you get out alive is because your brave organization mentor sacrificed themselves for you. R.I.P. Warmaster Forgor, gone. It's here at Claw Island that we start teaming up with a talking tree called Traherne. Traherne was one of the first Silvari to ever awaken, and his task in life is to cleanse ore of Zaitan's corruption. Traherne knew about the attack and tried to prevent it, but he ultimately failed as well. After we lose Claw Island, we travel with Traherne to the leader of the tree people, who is a white tree called the Pale Tree because racism. The White Tree makes a sword out of her body and gives it to Traherne, then you and Traherne go rally the three organizations and retake Claw Island from the Risen. All three organizations decide to come together and form a unified group called the Pact, with Traherne as the leader and you as the commander. With the Pact behind you and some fancy airships at the helm, you advance into Or. You destroy the Eye of Zaitan, blinding Zaitan, and cleanse the city of Or. Traherne was really out there putting in work, so he gets all tired and needs to rest and decides to not help in the fight against Zaitan whatsoever. Clearly this tree does not lead by example. Anyways, finally, you confront Zaitan with the help of a reunited Destiny's Edge and take to the skies in a fancy airship. You go kill the mouth of Zaitan to weaken the dragon and a massive battle ensues in the skies between the packed airships and Zaitan's minions until eventually the dragon comes to fight you. With your big ship, you blast its tail off, then shoot it with laser beams. Then, finally, at the pinnacle of this epic confrontation, you shoot a cannon over and over and over and over and over again at Zaitan's face until eventually he dies. With Cthulhu, the Elder Dragon of Death vanquished, everyone goes out and parties hard because you saved the day, and that is the end of the base game. Next, we have Living World Season 1, which can't be played anymore, but that's alright because you have me. After killing the Elder Dragon of Death, our next enemy is a ginger tree named Scarlet Briar who is here to take your soul. Scarlet grew up being the rebellious child, but was extremely intelligent and a fast learner. She eventually helped build and enter Omad's machine, which showed her the eternal alchemy. This is basically the ideology of the rat people called Asurans that everything in the universe is connected and intertwined. So essentially, Scarlet got a glimpse at how the world works. In doing so, she discovered a terrible secret, but we'll reveal that later on. After her time in the machine, she began to have terrible nightmares and would hear whispers in her head and basically was slowly descending into madness. The whispers eventually led her to study ley lines, which you can think of as rivers of magic where tons of magic flows in the current. Scarlet became very interested in two things. First, finding ley line hubs where multiple ley lines intersected and there were large concentrations of magic flowing. And second, trying to figure out how to reverse the direction that the magic was flowing in the ley lines. In her pursuits, she manipulated six different groups into three different alliances. First is the Molten Alliance, which was formed from the Flame Legion and the Dredge. The Flame Legion are Char that use fire magic, and the Dredge are Mole People, and Scarlet made this alliance because she found that Dredge metal tempered with Flame Legion pyres could conduct magic in the ley lines without breaking. 
Second are the Aetherblades, which are formed from the Inquest and a group of Sky Pirates. The Inquest are basically the baddest Cerns that want to know the Eternal Alchemy to rule over the universe, and the Sky Pirates are pirates that like the sky. Scarlet created the Aetherblades to basically steal a ton of airships and bolster her numbers. Third is the Toxic Alliance, which was formed from Crate and some members of the Nightmare Court. Crate are evil snake lizards that tend to be around water, while the Nightmare Court are basically evil Savari that want to corrupt the White Tree. The Toxic Alliance was in charge of creating a giant tower of nightmares that would cause, well, nightmares, and would poison the land. Scarlet went around wreaking havoc and even hijacked the Human Queen's new Watch Knights to become mechanical monsters. Through your various fights and encounters along the way, you start to form friendships and eventually, way down the line, you form Dragon's Watch. Dragon's Watch is literally the exact same thing as Destiny's Edge, but with new characters that all want to do the same thing as before, save the world from Elder Dragons. Your new best friends are Ritlock Brimstone, because shut up, he's friggin' awesome, Brom Erson, who friggin' sucks, this Norn is a guardian with the face of a donkey and the mind of a sheep, and the only reason that he exists is because he's Air's son. Casimir Mead, who is our resident human mesmer and beauty queen. Marjorie Delacroix, who is our resident human necromancer. Guild Wars 2 decided to make Casimir and Marjorie lovers in the night, so listen up everybody. If the weird goth girl that plays with dead things can get the prom queen, you can too. Next up is Rox, who's our Char Ranger that just frankly has huge eyes, so maybe she was pulled straight out of Little Red Riding Hood, except this big bad wolf has a cute white pet devourer called Frostbite. Finally, we have our Asurin Engineer, Tymie, who is the smallest Asurin that you're ever going to meet. Tymie is a young genius who solves all our problems and lets her golem Scruffy do all the fighting. She also has a degenerative disease that prevents her from walking very far, and this could spread to her other limbs at some point, though it's in remission right now. Now, Dragon's Watch doesn't officially form yet in the story, but I'm just going to refer to these people as Dragon's Watch instead of listing everyone individually all the time. With the help of Dragon's Watch, you stop Scarlet at every turn, but eventually she finds what she's looking for, and it's underneath Lion's Arch. Scarlet locates a ley line hub under Lion's Arch and has now built a drill that can penetrate the ley line hub and reverse the flow of magic in the ley lines. With her army ready, she attacks Lion's Arch and absolutely destroys the city and then begins to drill. You show up with Dragon's Watch and fight your way to her and eventually you get to Scarlet and have an epic showdown where you eventually defeat and kill her. Just as you think you've won, the drill hits the ley line hub and Scarlet's plan comes to fruition. The magic in the ley lines reverse their direction and the line of energy shoots out into the heart of Maguma where we witness the awakening of the next Elder Dragon, Mordramoth. Mordramoth is the Elder Dragon of Plants and Mind who is also known as the Jungle Dragon and his minions are the Mordrum. This concludes Living World Season 1, and now we move to Living World Season 2, where the city of Lion's Arch is rebuilt with a fresh coat of paint. A Zephrite airship crash lands in the Maguma Waste, and it contains a very important man called the Master of Peace. The Master of Peace is the leader of the Zephrites, who are a traveling, zen-like organization of mostly humans. We learn that a Solvari named Aaron caused the crash and is after the Master of Peace. We finally catch up to Aaron and kill him, and the Master of Peace is like, okay, bye. He's apparently got very important stuff to do. In the Maguma Waste, we find Omad's machine and enter it ourselves, where we witness the eternal alchemy just as Scarlet Briar did. There, we see six orbs that are thought to be the Elder Dragons, and the green one in our vision takes the spot in the middle, and then everything starts to turn all eerie and scary. Afterwards, you help Ritlock out because he believes that he's found a way to lift the curse of Ascalon off his homeland. However, when he slams his sword into the ground to actually lift the curse, it creates a portal that his sword drops into, so naturally, he jumps in after it. It's believed this portal led to the mists, and the mists are as difficult to explain as Inception. But basically, the Miss is the place between worlds that constitutes the fabric of time and space that connects the multiverse and everything in it together. Just think of it as the weird place between worlds and you're going to be just fine.
With Mordramoth awake, the leaders of the five races gather in the grove to discuss coming together to fight the Elder Dragon, and during the summit, everyone winds up getting attacked by Mordrum and the Shadow of the Dragon, which is one of Mordramoth's champions. You, being the war machine from hell that you are, easily dispatch everything, but unfortunately, during the attack, the White Tree got some physical and emotional damage, so she shows you a vision of a crystal egg being swallowed up by vines and thorns. Could she have just told you everything using her big girl words? Yes. Did she? No. So, you go to the bowels of the Durman Priory archives and meet a stone dwarf named Ogden Stonehealer, who makes you touch a funky hourglass, which teleports you to Glint's lair. Remember Glint, the only good elder dragon that Destiny's Edge let die by the claws of Krakatoric? We are in her lair, and we witness a very shocking vision of the Master of Peace taking Glint's last remaining dragon egg. We return back and Ogden tells us that we need to help the Master of Peace transport the egg to wherever the heck he's trying to take it. So you and Dragon's Watch and Karen Cave go out and eventually find the Master of Peace being attacked by Mordrum. You kill the Mordrum, but unfortunately the Master of Peace is dying and with his final breaths he tries to give you Glint's egg. But Karen Cave takes it and runs away with no explanation. <laughs> You go ask the White Tree about Kaith, and instead of talking using her big girl words, she gives you memory seats so that you can relive different memories of Kaith to learn about where she might have gone to hide. Her memories center around three characters. First is herself. Second is Fowlin, Kaith's lover, but also the leader of the Nightmare Court, and remember, those are the bad Solvari. However, these memories are from long before the Nightmare Court was ever created. Third is Wynne, who has ears and a face. Fowlin learns that Wynne knows a life-altering secret about all Solvari. Fowlin spends the entire time trying to get Wynne to disclose the secret, and Kaith is basically getting dragged along. Things get real bad when Fowlin and her tree thugs murder a bunch of centaurs and chase Wynne into a cave. There, Fowlin goes off to gather a bunch of bushes to torture Wynne with, and this leaves Wynne alone with Kaith. It's here where Wynne tells Kaith the secret that all Silvari are supposed to be minions of the Elder Dragon Mordramoth and come from him. Then, in a very emotional scene, Wynne makes Kaith kill her so that Fallon can never find out the truth. This giant secret was what Scarlet Briar had learned when she saw the Eternal Alchemy, and after her time in the machine, it was Mordramoth that was in her mind whispering and influencing her the whole time, and this is why Aaron tried to kill the Master of Peace. After the memory ends, you see Kaith in the murder cave, who tells you that she's on your side, but still refuses to give you the egg. Then, the shadow of the dragon appears, and while you kill Mordramoth's champion, Kaith slips away with the egg. Bitch. Living World Season 2 ends, with Traherne and the Pact flying their airships over the heart of Maguma, bombarding the forest, and then all of a sudden, vines shoot up and destroy the entire Pact fleet. Not only that, but many of the Silvari have begun to turn under Mordramoth's influence and begin killing their own. Destiny's Edge was on that packed fleet, and now they're all MIA somewhere in the heart of Maguma. And worst of all, Karen Kaith is still MIA with Glint's Egg. Now we're diving into the first expansion, Heart of Thorns. You, Dragon's Watch, and our kinda new friend Kanak make your way to the jungle. Kanak is a character that first shows up during the Scarlet Briar Crisis, but really doesn't become too important until now. Kanak is a badass tree that loves to blow stuff up and is basically owned by Countess Anise. Countess Anise is the leader of the Shining Blade, which is a fancy name for the group that protects the human damsel in distress, Queen Jenna. Kanak is sent by Countess Anise to represent the Shining Blade and helps us fight Mordramoth. Once you enter the jungle, you find that Destiny's Edge and Traherne have been taken prisoner. You also get attacked by Mordrum, and out of nowhere, Ritlock appears with his sword and is now blindfolded and is now suddenly a revenant. Ritlock isn't the only one with new tricks though, because now your character can glide. Instead of falling and dying, simply glide and fly through the air to wherever you want to go. 
You head west and eventually find a Mordrum prison cell and Ritlock tells you that a Destiny's Edge member is inside of it. You fight your way to the cell and find that both Air and Fowlin are inside of the cell, so you break them out just as some Mordrum Vinetooths are approaching. Fowlin slips and falls, so Air tries to help her up, but as she does so, Fowlin stabs Air with a thorn. Air then takes that thorn and throws it at Fowlin and impales her as well. One of the Vinetooths impale Fallon and drag her body away while Air stares down the other Vinetooth in her last act of defiance before being impaled and killed in front of her son, Bram. We slay the Vinetooth and leave Bram to his grieving as Rox elects to stay behind and watch over him. We push on and run into a shiny energy being called Ruka, who said that he's been tracking energy sources similar to Glint's, so we join up with him until we finally catch up to Kaith and the Egg. Kaith is being ragdolled by her biggest weakness, the Manager. Here, the Manager is a Mordrum Vinetooth Fallon hybrid, which now totally explains what happened to Fallon after she got impaled. We escape with the Egg, and Ruka invites us to take the Egg to Tarir, the Forgotten City which happens to be sitting on another leyline hub. We go to the massive golden city and learn that the big shiny floating energy dudes are called Exalted. Exalted used to be humans tasked with the job of protecting Glint's legacy, aka Glint's egg. To fulfill this task, the Forgotten, and remember these are the old snake people with four arms that freed Glint from Kralkatorik's control, did some ritual to turn them into energy beings that aren't affected by dragon magic. These Exalted built Tarir to hold Glint's egg until it hatches, and this city was where the Master of Peace was taking the egg all along. Once you place the egg in the chamber underneath the city, the egg gives you a vision where Zoja, Logan, and Traherne are captives of Mordremoth, and the Elder Dragon is using them as templates to make new Mordrem in their likeness. This prompts you to leave the egg in Tarir and continue after Mordremoth. You find a map that shows you another nearby ley line hub, and the Exalted tell you that it's Radinovis. Radinovis is an old lost city of Asurans that were conducting research on how to defeat Elder Dragons. You find the lost city empty and deserted, with a ton of chalk scattered around everywhere. Chalk are spawns of Satan that hit like friggin' trucks. They're also insect creatures that feed off ley lines, so naturally they were drawn to Radinovis and wiped out all the Asurans that used to live here long ago. You find your way to the secret laboratory, and it states that each Elder Dragon has a unique weakness, although it doesn't actually tell us what Mordremoth's weakness is. It just reassures you that the jungle dragon can be killed. You travel deep into Mordremoth territory, and eventually find Zoja and Logan being held in pods where Mordrem clones were being produced from their likeness. We free them so they can go home and recover, and then we spot Vinetooth Fallon and chase her deeper towards Mordremoth and along the way we run into Kate, who says that she wants to now help us. We wind up chasing Fallon into the Heart of Thorns where Traherne is being held and eventually we fight and slay Fallon. As we finish killing her, Traherne is pulled into the depths by a long tendril so we chase down after him. We find Traherne and man does it look like this guy has been through hell. Half his body is consumed in a blight pod at the end of Tendrils, and he literally tells us that he is part of the jungle dragon now. Traherne warns us that Mordremoth is way too vast to destroy, so we decide that we're not going to attack its body, but we're going to attack its mind. All Silvari are linked to the dream, which you can basically think of as the cognitive realm, and this is where Mordremoth has been attacking Silvari and turning them into his minions. So you and two companions use Traherne's link to Mordremoth to enter the dream to destroy Mordremoth's mind. Inside, you fight a ton of nightmares and illusions, and finally, you fight the avatar of Mordremoth himself, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that you fight his mind. And let's be honest, this dragon is a little bit of a porker. Like, this dude for sure has not been hitting the gym and is basically rocking a dad bod. You fight Mordremoth in an epic battle that really tests your mettle, and eventually, you defeat the Elder Dragon Mordremoth. You exit the dream, and Traherne has one last request for you. 
He wants you to kill him with his own sword because Mordremoth had placed a seed in Traherne's mind. And he is the last remnant of Mordremoth's mind and influence. So, you plunge the sword into Traherne, ridding the world of Mordremoth once and for all. As Traherne dies, Mordremoth's dragon magic explodes into the ley lines, and we witness one of the lines travel straight to Tarir and into Glint's dragon egg, which seemingly energizes it out of stasis. And that ends Heart of Thorns. Now we're moving on to Living World Season 3, where the story gets phenomenal. At Air's funeral, you and Ritlock officially create Dragon's Watch. Kanak comes to you later asking for help with the minister Caudicus who escaped from prison. Anise, the lady who basically owns Kanak, said that once Caudicus is brought to justice, Kanak is a free tree. We're traveling in an airship when a massive explosion occurs, and just as the explosion is about to consume the airship, the blast inverts and the energy seems to be absorbed backwards. It appears as if a bloodstone was shattered. A bloodstone is a large, powerful stone that was created long ago by Sears, and it's designed to contain vast stores of magic that hasn't been corrupted from Elder Dragons. Near the blast site, there are pack troops and white mantle, and everybody is acting crazy because of bloodstone magic. White mantle are basically the bad humans who think that they should be the rightful rulers of all humans on Tyrion. We make our way to the blast site and find that a ritual was performed where some people died and someone or something absorbed a ton of bloodstone magic. We pursue Minister Codicus to a coliseum where he summons a jade construct, which is something Tyria hasn't seen since the days of the Mersat, and Codicus also tells us that he's the leader of the White Mantle. Mursat were an ancient and evil race of deadly spellcasters who have been extinct for hundreds of years, and their foot soldiers were the Jade Constructs, which are basically chunks of Jade held together by magic. Anyway, we easily kill the Construct, when out of nowhere, a Mursat appears and says that he's Lazarus the Dyer. And oh yeah, Mursat are basically gods to the White Mantle. So. Lazarus shows up and says Caudicus is a heretic and not a leader, and then Lazarus incinerates most of Caudicus' followers. Then, Laz vanishes and Caudicus gets portaled away at the last second before Kanak can reach him. It's also very clear that Lazarus was the one who must have absorbed all that bloodstone magic from the ritual. So we have no Lazarus and no Caudicus, and then we get some dire news from Tymie. Primordus, the Elder Dragon of Fire, is awake and active. And if that wasn't bad enough, next, Bram tells us that Jormag, the Elder Dragon of Ice, is also awake and active. Primordus minions, by the way, are called Destroyers, and Jormag minions are called Ice Brood. Primordus is traveling to the Ring of Fire Islands, so the commander goes there as well, and it's discovered that Primordus' destroyers have been augmented here with death and plant magic. So basically, now we're dealing with death plant destroyers from hell. While checking out the volcanoes, we get a vision of Glint's egg hatching in Tarir, so we instantly drop everything and sprint right back to Tarir. We enter the egg chamber, and bada bing bada boom, a new baby dragon is born. Unfortunately, just as the dragon is hatching, death plant destroyers from hell emerge and come after the dragon. We start to get overwhelmed when suddenly, out of nowhere, Lazarus shows up and helps defend the dragon. After the destroyers are vanquished, Lazarus states that he wishes to stand with you against the elder dragons. But to be honest, we don't really trust Laz at all, so we have Marjorie hang out with him because she likes death a lot. We also decide to trust Karen Kaithmore and tell her to guard the new baby girl dragon, whom we name Orin. Next, we hear of a giant ice brood containing death and plant magic, so we head to the far northern Shiver Peaks to check it out. We find the Goliath behind a frozen waterfall, and it clearly has plant and death magic imbued into it, so we take it out and we grab a sample for timing. We also go save Bram and Rox, who were in the area looking for a magical scroll that could be used to take out Jormag. We find the scroll, and Bram imbues the magic into his mother's bow, and then we kill an ice beast, and we call it a day. 
Bram takes the magical bow back to Holbrook, which is the main Norn city, and fires an arrow into Jormag's tooth, which is hanging for all to see. And the arrow cracks the tooth. And this rallies the Norn to try and fight Jormag. Human damsel in distress, Queen Jenna, calls us to Divinity's Reach, the main human city. And while there, the city gets attacked by White Mantle and other traitorous ministers. Having enough of Codicus, who's holed up in a giant manor, you and your crew, along with Codicus' own daughter, Demi, infiltrate the manor and bring the fight to Codicus, who is now glowing with bloodstone energy. This crazy prick literally shoots his own daughter. And yeah, it was fatal. This man literally killed his own daughter, setting an all-time low for fathers everywhere. After Codicus kills his own daughter, we chase him until he becomes a giant brute, and we finally kill Tyria's worst dad. Because we bring Codicus to justice, a niece releases Kanak from her service, and he is now a free tree. After we kill Codicus, we take a look around the manor to figure out exactly what he's been up to, and it's here that we learn about the division among the White Mantle. Half of the White Mantle sided with Codicus and followed him, but the other half was splintering off under the lead of High Inquisitor Zara, who's honestly a quite fun raid boss. Zara had set out to resurrect Lazarus by gathering his five aspects and performing a ritual. Well, we saw Lazarus already, so clearly Zara's ritual must have worked, right? Wrong. Codicus had secretly swapped out one of the aspects, which means that Zara's ritual to bring Lazarus back couldn't have worked, which means that we have a giant question now, lads. Who the heck is the floating Mersat looking creature claiming to be Lazarus? Timey calls us back to Radinovis, where she's putting the finishing touches on a device that she says can defeat both Primordus and Jormag at the same time. Fun note, this machine is apparently based off Omad's machine. Anyways, Lazarus shows up with a bunch of thugs, so we set a trap to drop the illusion and finally see who we're dealing with, and it turns out to be Balthazar, the human god of war and fire. Let's take a sec and talk about the human gods. There are six human gods who are all extremely powerful divine beings from beyond the mists. Their powers rival those of the Elder Dragons. The gods brought humans to Tyria a long time ago and settled them in Cantha. In the beginning, there were six. Duena, the goddess of healing, air, and life. Melandru, goddess of nature, earth, and growth. Lyssa, goddess of beauty, water, and illusion. Balthazar, god of war, fire, and challenge. Doom, god of death and darkness. And finally, Abaddon god of knowledge and secrets. Each god also possessed their own domain or realm inside of the mists. Two important personnel changes have occurred to the human gods since the beginning. First, the demigod Grent, who is Duena's son, rose up and fought against Doom. Eventually, he won and sealed Doom away in the god of death's own realm, the Underworld. Since locking him away, Grenth took his place as the new god of death. Second, Abaddon wound up fighting against the other gods over the distribution of magic to humans, and this led to a war that ended with the gods imprisoning Abaddon in his own realm called the Realm of Torment. Unfortunately, Abaddon was still able to influence the world and cause problems, and this was actually the main villain in the original Guild Wars video game, which is still an amazing game to this day. Anyways, a group of heroes entered the Realm of Torment and killed Abaddon. When Abaddon died, there was a powerful blast of magic that erupted from his body that threatened to consume and destroy Tyria. But thankfully, the Sun Spear Cormir, with the help of the other five gods, absorbed Abaddon's energy and ascended to become the new god of knowledge and truth. The event of Abaddon's death is actually what began the awakening of the Elder Dragons across Tyria. The gods saw the death and destruction that resulted in wars among the gods and decided to depart Tyria and only look at it from afar. They also pointedly decided not to fight the Elder Dragons as they believed it would destroy Tyria. Alright, now that you have a very brief history of the six human gods, let's get back to our story, because Balthazar was the one pretending to be Lazarus the whole time. 
Balthazar takes Timey's machine and teleports away, but luckily Timey put a tracker on the machine so we follow it to a giant volcano in the Fire Islands, and this just so happens to be the place that Primordius is lying. Along the way, Timey did a little research and thinks that if one more Elder Dragon gets destroyed, it would destabilize the flow of magic so hard that all of Tyria will be destroyed. So, we travel down to the bottom of the volcano where Balthazar is using the machine to pull energy and magic from Primordis and then shoot it at Jormag. And at the same time, he's pulling energy and magic from Jormag and shooting it at Primordis. And the whole time, he's standing in direct line of both of them absorbing both of the Elder Dragon's magic and power. Balthazar summons his two dogs whom we kill and then Taimi overloads the machine before it kills the Elder Dragons. The machine blows up, Balthazar disappears, and both Primordis and Jormag return to their dormant states after being weakened. After the volcano, you meet up with a niece who makes you a shining blade and tells you that Balthazar had one of the five aspects needed to resurrect Lazarus. The shining blade plans on getting all five aspects, resurrecting Lazarus, then immediately stabbing him to death to get rid of the last Mersat once and for all. So, you travel to Or, gather up the five aspects, revive the real Lazarus, then immediately stab him to death. Once the real Lazarus is dead, you use a powerful artifact called the Eye of Janthir to see what your favorite god of war is up to. Turns out, Balthazar is going to the Crystal Desert to hunt down the elder dragon Kralkatoric, the father of Glint and the grandfather of Orin. Before we hop into the second expansion, Path of Fire, I just want to take a quick sec to say thank you guys so much for watching my super long video here. And I promise you guys, I've actually condensed a lot of this story down. There's just 10 years of content to try to get through here. And I wanted to put in a lot of work and effort to try and make this an all-encompassing story recap. And I just want to say if you're enjoying the video and you want to help me out as a content creator, you can always drop a like on the video, you can sub to the channel, and you can leave comments down below in the video. And all those are free ways to help me out as a creator. All right, back to the God of War. We arrive in Alona, which is basically a continent of land that's primarily desert, and discover a new enemy type called the Forge, who are attacking people. Forged are constructs of metal and fire that are imbued with souls of the dead. We also run into Balthazar's Herald, who says that we should team up and all kill Krakatoric together. We decide to give her the middle finger, so she starts slaughtering everybody, and not just the men, but the women and the children too. We're then introduced to the new mechanic in the game, mounts. Mounts are creatures that we ride to make our lives easy and here we get a raptor. Then we head to the city of Amnoon, which is basically the main hub of civilization in the desert. Outside the city, there are refugees that had to deal with forged and branded attacks. So you go talk to them and one of the refugees says that they were saved by Vlast. So naturally, we ask who that? Turns out, Vlast is the child of Glint and the older brother of Orin. Vlast was born before Krakatoric even slew Glint and has recently been in the desert fighting Branded and being a protector to the people here. We also learn that Balthazar isn't currently after Krakatoric, but he's after Vlast for some reason. We go raid some forged camps and then find out that they're building a big machine and stockpiling Branded shards, which are small concentrations of Krakatoric's power. We head to the Temple of Cormir, where a guy from the Order of Shadows approaches us, offering to help. The Order of Shadows is literally the same exact thing as the Order of Whispers, it's just the desert version that splintered off a while back. The Herald of Balthazar shows up and starts killing innocents and burns the temple in retribution for us taking out their camps. We chase after the Herald and eventually find Balthazar and the Herald cornering Vlast. We kill the Herald and then find Vlast all chained up. We confront Balthazar with Ritlock by our side, and Balthazar calls the Char a friend and says that he's going to spare his life. What? You, on the other hand, are not so lucky, and he beats your ass harder than when your mama does when you talk back. Balthazar goes in for the killing blow when Vlast breaks free of his chains and dives in front of the attack, getting impaled instead of you. Vlast crystallizes and then explodes into a thousand fragments. After the explosion, Balthazar is nowhere to be found, and Orin has lost a brother. We immediately get up and start questioning Ritlock about his new BFF Balthazar. Alright, well remember when Ritlock jumped into the mist portal after his flaming sword? Turns out that Ritlock found his sword in the mist, but the fire was extinguished. 
there was a man chained up nearby that offered to reignite the sword for him in exchange for his freedom. So Ritlock's dumbass was like, yeah, sure, why not? And freed the man, and that turned out to be Balthazar all along. The shards of crystal that Vlast exploded into were turned into memory crystals, where we got to hear the thoughts of Vlast. These memory crystals tell us that there's a powerful weapon hidden in Glint's lair, so we travel to Glint's lair and find a bloodstone spear still intact. The same bloodstone spear that Glint made for Destiny's Edge to kill Krakatoric with. We also find a Glint memory crystal, which talks about her children needing to fulfill her legacy. It also shows her questioning what the six human gods know that she doesn't. After listening to the memory crystal, we destroy the bloodstone spear and decide to travel into the mist in an attempt to find the human gods and ask them for help. So we set out for the tomb of the primeval kings and enter a portal there that takes us into the mist. We eventually make our way to a great library where we meet the goddess Cormir. Cormir tells us that the gods knew their inevitable conflict with the Elder Dragons would result in the destruction of Tyria, so they chose to withdraw into the mists. However, Balthazar disagreed and wanted to destroy the Elder Dragons and consume their power. So the other five gods stripped him of his power and chained him up in the mists so that he could never come after the Elder Dragons or the gods. However, a certain Char that wanted his sword to be on fire freed Balthazar in the mists. Balthazar then used Lissa's mirror to create the illusion of Lazarus, which prevented even the gods from knowing of his return. The gods had chosen to leave, and by the time the illusion was broken, the only god that remained was Cormir, who is currently on her way out. Cormir cites how the last battle between the gods was against Abaddon, and that created the desolation and warped the land so hard, so she refuses to start a new war between the gods. Before she leaves to join the other gods, she tells us to follow Vlast's trail and restore what's been broken. While looking for clues, we come across the lost city of Kesho, which was built by the Forgotten, but it's been buried under sand for a really long time. Kesho was the location where the Forgotten first turned humans into Exalted, where they could train and protect Glint's first child, Vlast. Basically, Kesho was the first Tarir, and it's here that we make three huge discoveries. First, Balthazar and Palawa Joko both came through Kesho and learned the Forgotten Ritual that made Exalted. Then, they twisted the ritual so that they could force souls into armored bodies and then create Balthazar's forged army. This is really the first time that I'm mentioning Palawa Ignatius Joko, so I need to give a little backstory. Joko is a powerful undead lich who's made himself the sovereign over all of Alona. His minions are the Awakened, who are undead, and the Mordant Crescent, who are basically ex-sunspears, and they can be either alive or dead. Joko has been in power for so long and has warped the culture so hard that it's considered an honor to finally die so that you can join his awakened army. He also tries to rewrite history to make himself the hero as any classic narcissist would. So apparently, the undead Lich King of Alona is in leagues with Balthazar. The second giant revelation is that we learn what the Forgotten and Glint's plan really was. They knew that killing Elder Dragons would leave huge voids and disrupt the cycle of magic to the point that it would cause the world to be destroyed. So their plan was to replace the Elder Dragons with creatures that would be kind and circulate the magic as opposed to hoarding it like the current Elder Dragons. So in other words, Glint and her children were meant to destroy and replace the current Elder Dragons. The third and final revelation is that we finally learn what Krakatoric's own weakness is. Krakatoric's own crystals all share a fundamental resonance that connects back to the dragon and make them vulnerable to one another. This means that not only branded crystals and dragon blood spears could kill Krakatoric, but also Glint, Vlast, and Orin as well. This is why Balthazar was after Vlast. It's to use the dragon to slay Krakatoric, and with Glint and Vlast gone, there's only one dragon left for him to try to take. You go meet with Dragon's Watch to tell them what you've learned and to get to Orin as fast as humanly possible, but Balthazar ambushes you and puts you on your back again. Then Orin shows up to defend you, and Balthazar easily captures the baby dragon. With Orin captured, Balthazar kills you. You wake up in the Domain of the Lost, which is part of the Underworld, aka Grent's Realm. The Domain of the Lost is where souls go that have died traumatic deaths and forget themselves. Here, we find none other than the Scourge of Vavi himself, Palawa Joko, in chains and behind bars. 
he tells us that he helped Balthazar access the Domain of the Lost so that he could take the souls here and create Forged out of them. And this explains why his forces kept slaughtering everyone. It was to send their souls to the Domain of the Lost and then take their souls and make Forged out of them. Joko was supposed to get a share of the souls to recruit into his Awakened army, but Balthazar wound up betraying him and locked him in the Domain of the Lost. So we go collect our memories and realize that we need to get back to Tyria so we kill a nasty demon, take its energy, and as we're on our way out, Joko tries to convince us that we need him and his army to defeat Balthazar. Our response is simple. We do need Joko's army, but we don't need Joko because in Joko's absence, the Mordant Crescent are in charge and we can manipulate them. So we take a portal back to our body in Tyria and tell our friends the plan. Then we go assassinate Archon Ibaru, who's a high-ranking Morden Crescent, and then we have Kazmir put an illusion on us to look like Ibaru. Then we go around and tell all Joko's forces to prepare for a giant battle against Balthazar's forces. As the armies draw near, Ritlock gives you his flaming sword, Sahothan. He knows that Balthazar will focus you, and that sword used to belong to Balthazar himself long ago, so they know it can kill him. With Sahothan in hand, the epic battle between Forged and Awakened begins, but it seems Balthazar has built a giant war beast and trapped Orin inside of it. We follow the war beast all the way up to Joko's Sky Garden, where we see it firing at Kralkator, severely weakening the dragon. Finally, we make it to the top and fight the gigantic mechanical beast. After a lot of metal, sweat, and tears, you destroy the machine. But that was just the appetizer. With the war beast destroyed, it's time to kill a god. We have an epic showdown with the god of war and fire, and with Orin freed, we now have a dragon to aid us. In the end, we kill Balthazar, and as he dies, he explodes magical energy out from his body. Some of this energy we see get absorbed into Orin, but most of this energy we see get absorbed into Kralkatoric. Path of Fire ends with Kralkatoric flying over the desert, corrupting everything in his path. And now we dive into Living World Season 4. We begin outside Amnoon, hanging out with Dragon's Watch, when a full-on brandstorm erupts over the city without Kralkatoric appearing. We go kill a ton of branded with Orin showing up to help out, and then she gives us a vision. In the vision, we see an army of Awakened in a city which is identified as Farner. Farner is the long-abandoned city in Istan where the primeval kings used to live before the Scarab Plague ravaged the city. The Scarab Plague was a disease that caused scarabs to grow under people's skin until the bugs burst out of the host body and killed them, which wins Tyria's second worst way to die award. First is obviously dying to donkey-faced Bram. Anyways, we make our way to Istan and we're killing Awakened when we learn that Taimi has been captured by Palawa Joko and he's taken her to far and earth. Clearly, when Balthazar died, the chains holding Joko in the Domain of the Lost disappeared and the undead Lich King was free. So we head to Farner with Ritlock and Kanak and come across some super interesting Inquest Awakened. Then as we dive further in, we run into Brahm and Rox, who haven't been with us at all in this adventure. They tell us that the Awakened here have been showing up all across Tyria via portals, so those two hopped through some of those portals to see where it would lead and it brought them to us. So we all team up and we make our way to a gate hub where Inquest Awakened are going through portals and in the middle is Tymie, trapped in her golem Scruffy 2.0. We break Scruffy and then free Tymie, who tells us that Joko had the Awakened experimenting with bugs. Next we need to find out what Joko's up to, so we get a lead that there might be two Inquest scientists that could be able to figure out what Joko's doing and their brothers, Blish and Gorik, whom Tymie knows from her time in college. So we go infiltrate an inquest lab and find out that Blish and Gork are in a lab called Rata Primus. So we portal to a lab nearby and break out a char that's being experimented on. The char takes us to her people called the Olmacan, who are sand shifters that have fled from the Flame Legion a long time ago. The inquest attack the Olmacan, so then the Olmacan help us attack Rata Primus. We arrive at Rata Primus and it's in chaos because Awakened have attacked with Blish and Gork being trapped inside. So we fight our way to them and make a shocking discovery. Turns out, Blish is a golem now. We also learn that Joko broke into the lab and stole all the research the Inquest had on the Scarab Plague. We catch up to Joko, who has his commander attack us in a really awesome fight where you portal around to different locations and eventually kill the commander under a beautiful starry sky before teleporting back and reuniting Gork, Blish, and Tymie. In Amnoon, Gork has experimented and figured out that the Scarab Plague only affects humans. 
After being told this, we go welcome a supply boat sent by the new leader of the pact, Pretty Boy Logan. However, when the boat docks, we witness that Joko had unleashed the Scarab Plague on the ship. We destroy the plague that was on the ship and kill the newly awakened forces, and afterwards, Joko invites us to the Fortress Gandera in the Domain of Korna. So we take our forces and assault the fortress, and eventually make our way to the top and have a showdown with Joko. We ultimately defeat him. W well, as much as you can defeat an undead lich, and this kind of leads to what I would consider the best cutscene cinematic in Guild Wars 2. So I'm just going to sit back and let you guys enjoy it. The rumors of my immortality are drastically understated. Oh, Commander, you look so disappointed, so impotent. I feel for you. I really do. But let's be honest. You knew in your heart. Fear not. The world will not forget you. The scars you've gouged into it spell out your name for all to see. I confess I was happy to take credit for your victories. But did you ever stop to wonder what that says about you? That so many bought what I was selling. They call me a monster, and you a hero. The world expects Palawa Joko to dare to throw reality into chaos. But surely, no mortal would be so monumentally stupid as to destroy a dragon. The life force of this world! Let alone two, and a god to boot! Perhaps they will finally thank me for luring you to me, so that I may save the world from you. And once you're gone, everyone will flock to my embrace. They will all love me, Palawa. Ignatius! That's right. Orin literally eats the undead lich Joko. Man, this story is awesome. Alright, so now that Joko is dead, we have a conference to figure out what exactly is going to happen between all the different organizations in Alona, and during our meeting, Archon Ibaru, the guy that we killed and impersonated to steal Joko's army, attacks us, but at the same time, a Death-Branded Shatterer attacks. A Death-Branded Shatterer is a champion of Kralkatoric, but since Kralk had absorbed some of Zaitan's magic, he imbued his champions with the death magic as well to make them stronger. Once we escape the fortress, we witness a portal opening that leads to the mist, and the death-branded Shatterer flies right into it. So now we learn that Kralkatoric is residing in the mists. Elder Dragons have never been able to access the mist before, but guys, remember, Kralkatoric consumed Balthazar's magic, and the gods could create portals into the mist whenever they wanted. Everyone decides to go to an old abandoned Sunspear Sanctuary called Sun's Refuge that's deep underground which should be a safe place from the brand. While there, a branded rift, which is the name for the portals that Krokotoric is making, opens up and then when you go to fight the branded, the ghost of Air and Snaff come to aid you. They don't have much time but they've come to deliver a message. The ghost of Glint is in the mist right now fighting off Krokotoric, but she's losing. Krakatoric is consuming the magical energy in the mist, and if he continues, he's going to devour reality itself. Glint sent Aaron Snaff to relay the message to Orin that it's time for her to fulfill her destiny and kill Krakatoric and take his place as an elder dragon. When Orin is told this, she has a vision that we all get to witness. 
In her vision, she sees a ton of possibilities of us fighting Kralkatoric. And in every single instance, Kralkatoric kills Orin. Orin is pretty distraught about the vision and then runs away. In the meantime, Blish thinks of a way to track Kralkatoric through the mists. He plans on putting a tracker in Balthazar's sword and then having the dragon consume the blade. So we go get Balthazar's sword and then we head into a brand rift to get dumped somewhere into the mist alongside the golem Blish. In the mist, we witness Glint and her army fighting the branded in an attempt to help us out. We plant the sword and activate the tracker, but the power source dies out, so Blish stays behind and uses his own golem's power to activate the tracker, effectively killing himself. Krakatoric consumes the sword and the tracker, and Glint opens a portal for you to get back to Korna. Once we're back, Tiny lets you know that her condition isn't in remission anymore, and that it will eventually kill her. Karen Kaith tells us that we need to go to Ogden the Dwarf, and when we arrive, he makes us go to Glint's lair and watch all three How to Train Your Dragon movies. Then, once we've trained as Dragon and Champion, Glint tells us how her legacy started. Kralkatoric foresaw a future where the world was at peace and there was no strife between dragons and mortals, but that world only existed without him. Glint said that Kralkatoric feared this future and wanted to prevent it from coming to pass. After our history lesson, Glint portals us to Thunderhead Peak where we need to forge new Bloodstone Spears and where all our allies are gathering to fight the Elder Dragon. While preparing, a ghost sent by Glint shows up to inform us that Glint's army has been beaten back and defeated, and that Kralkatoric is devouring the domain of the lost, and his power is getting out of control. Just then, a brandstorm appears underground, which you fight back, and Orin ends up doing her own version of branding on the branded to seal away the storm. Then, with Karen Kate's permission, Orin transforms Kate with her own magic to create a deep mental and emotional bond, which literally lets Orin speak through Kate, essentially making Kate the mouth of Orin, even though Kate still remains herself just blue and crystally. Now that Glint's army has failed, it's time to fight the Elder Dragon before he gets too powerful. So we drop a mountain on him and attack him with resonance crystals and bloodstone spears, and we give him the beating of his life. But it wasn't enough. He charges up an attack at us, and Orin gets in between us and tries to defend us. We get knocked out, and when we come to, Kralkatoric is gone, and we find Orin branded and dead. Everyone is devastated, and no one has any idea what to do. Then, all of a sudden, Orin starts to come back to life. And you're probably thinking, what? Alright guys, well remember the best villain in the game, Palawa Ignatius Joko? The undead lich that Orin ate and consumed? Yeah, she consumed his magic and now has the power to revive herself. This leads to an even rarer moment where Bram actually delivers a perfect line. <laughs> Praise Choco! <laughs> with Orin up, it's time to show Krakatoric that we are not done with him. We chase him into the mist, intent on getting him back into Tyria. We hit Krakatoric so hard that we literally sever one of his wings, and as he's falling in the mist, we open a portal back to Tyria. There, the Elder Dragon falls into the ocean and gets trapped under some debris, severely wounded. We gather up some blood and create a powerful dragon's blood spear. Then we literally fly in through his mouth and go to his heart where Kralkatoric is calling for Orin. Turns out all the different magics that Kralkatoric has been consuming are not mixing well and are creating a ton of agony and pain for the elder dragon. These other magics include Balthazars, Mordramoths, and Zaitans. So when we go into his body, we literally fight the torments raging inside of him, and Krakatoric is begging us to end his suffering. So we plunge the spear into his heart, and we kill our third Elder Dragon. But this time, instead of magical energies blasting out, Orin absorbs the magic from Krakatoric's death and ascends into an Elder Dragon streaking away as a prism of light. That ends Living World Season 4. So now we're on to the final chapter leading into End of Dragons, which is Season 5, The Ice Brood Saga. And this part of the story focuses heavily on the cat-like Char. Char have four primary legions within society, and each legion has a leader. 
Bangar Runebringer is the leader of the Blood Legion. Smolder the Unflinching is the leader of the Iron Legion. Malice Sword Shadow is the leader of the Ash Legion. And Ephraim Greets Glory is the leader of a Flame Legion splinter group that's trying to make amends for the Flame Legion's past crimes. There are two more important Char to introduce though. Cretia Stoneglow and Ryland Steelcatcher. Cretia is the second in command for the Blood Legion under Bangar and Ritlock's lover. Ryland is a high ranking officer in the Blood Legion and son of Ritlock and Cretia, who is proving to be quite the warrior. Alright, so you and Dragon's Watch are invited to a Char Festival where the opening form of entertainment is a battle between the last Branded and Ryland. However, before Ryland can kill the beast, Orin swoops in and crystallizes it. This really pisses off Ryland and Bangar. Afterwards, Donkeyface Bram and Ryland go off and have a fun time getting wasted. Bram winds up in jail, and when we go to get him out, guess who's missing the only bow in the entire world that's imbued with a powerful scroll that allows it to hurt Jormag? Yeah, Donkeyface Bram. We talk to Bangar, and it turns out that Ritlock and Bangar friggin' hate each other. So Ritlock starts beating the crap out of Bangar after Bangar says that it's a good thing Ryland had Bangar for a daddy. Damn! Later, we find out that Bangar, Ryland, and a ton of soldiers from all the legions have slipped away from the festival, and they were heavily armed. So we chase after them into the Shiver Peaks, which are basically huge snowy mountains. There, Bangar is giving a speech to the army saying that we have an elder dragon, so he wants to even the odds and get one for themselves. And while he's giving his speech, he's holding Air's bow, the one that Donkey Face Bram lost. Later, we get a super weird call from Almora, the leader of the vigil, who tells us to come to Jorah's Keep in Majora Marches. So you and the team fly over, and when you arrive, everyone is dead, and you find the son of Svanir body. Svanir are male Norns that worship Jormag and are basically part of his army. We track down Javi, Amora's second in command, and free her from the Svanir. During our time in Bajora, someone has been whispering in everyone's head trying to get them to turn on one another and it turns out that those whispers have been coming from Jormag, the Elder Dragon of Ice. And whispers. Eventually, we find Almora's dead corpse buried in Dark Rhyme Delves, and it's a very solemn moment, so we vow to figure out what happened. Next, we're off to kill the Frenier of Jormag, who's the leader of the Svanir, and he's the one that's been causing all these weird and nasty blizzards. After we kill him, Jormag reanimates the dead body and tells us that she wants to help Orin bring eternal peace to Tyria and that we need Jormag's help, so we politely give Jormag the middle finger. We press on and find Coden, who are polar bear people, and they tell us the whispers are coming from Jakar, a champion of Jormag. So we recruit and help some animal spirits who are basically like the Norn's gods, but they're just spirits of animals that help the Norn out. Anyways, we go fight Jakar and kill it, and then a creature called the Whisper of Jormag emerges from Jakar, and if you couldn't tell by the name, this is the thing that's doing all the whispering. So we fight the Whisper, and Bangar and Ryland actually show up and help us out. After we kill the Whisper, Bangar plans on telling the world that he slew Drakkar, and we're like, um, no? So Bangar shoots us with Air's bow, and as he's about to shoot us again for the kill, Bram decides to actually be useful for once in his life, so he turns into a wolf with the help of the wolf spirit, and fights off Ryland and Bangar, while Ritlock and Kreisha carry us away. We pass out and wake up next to Aureen in the Eye of the North, which is her new sanctuary. We've been out for quite some time, and Bangar, during that time, has told the world that he slew Jakar, and it's bringing a lot of char to his side. So Aureen was drawn to the Eye of the North because it holds a scrying pool, which has magical waters that have psychic powers that allow people to look into the past and witness events. We decide to use this power to see what Bangar and Ryland did after we saw Bangar giving his speech. Turns out, they went to Dark Rhyme Delves to find a passage through the Shiver Peaks for their army. Inside, they ran into Almora, who had been captured previously. When Bangar tells Almora about his plan to control Jormag, Almora flips out and tries to stop Bangar, so Ryland steps in and beats Almora in a fight. Then, with Almora on the ground, Bangar tells Ryland to kill her. 
Rylan questions the call and Bangar puts the knife in Almora himself and then makes Rylan get rid of the body. And that is how the leader of the vigil died. The Char are now in civil war against each other and it's the Dominion led by Bangar versus the United Legions, which is basically just everybody else. We head to Drizzlewood Coast and find a secret headquarters where we capture Cinder Steel Temper, Ryland's second in command and lover. With Cinder captive, we get Ryland to meet us for peace talks. Ryland wants to show a good faith from Cretia by letting Cinder go. This infuriates Smolder, who plunges a knife into Cinder's neck, effectively ending peace talks that could have happened. Ryland goes after Smolder, but Cretia protects Smolder, and Ryland views this as a huge betrayal. Ryland runs and we chase until we get to Wolf's Crossing where we run into some Ice Brood and the Frost Legion. The Frost Legion are Char that have been corrupted by Jormag and turned into his minions. We fight off the Frost Legion but mortar fires make us retreat and we wind up losing Ryland. Eventually, we take up a forward position and learn that Jormag is inside the Frost Citadel to the north. And that's where the Dominion are being converted into Frost Legion. Bram also finds something interesting nearby, and that's some Norn runes with a giant door that just so happens to be the place where the Spirits of the Wild first revealed themselves to the Norns. Back at camp, all the leaders are talking when out of nowhere, Smolder gets a sniper shot to the head and drops dead. And that just goes to show you everybody, don't stab people's lovers in the neck. It never ends well for you. The main army assaults the front door of the citadel while you and Bram try to get in through the back door locked by the spirits. You eventually unlock it and make your way all the way up to Bangar and Ryland. Bangar has the spirits of the wild captured and is sapping their magical energy in hopes to use it to control Jormag. Ryland is getting pissed off because he was just trying to wake Jormag up, not control it, so he starts fighting Bangar. We free the spirits and beat down on Bangar, but unfortunately, Jormag wakes up from her slumber. Jormag decides to turn Bangar into the voice of Jormag, which is literally nothing more than a puppet for her to speak through. Ryland, on the other hand, is transformed into a powerful champion of Jormag. Jormag and Ryland leave and give us Bangar as a gift so that Jormag can communicate with us whenever the Elder Dragon wants. Primordis is also awake and causing trouble, and we spend a good bit of time dealing with destroyer attacks and ice brood attacks all across Tyria. We return to the Eye of the North and use the scrying pool to figure out what Bram has been doing during this time. Turns out, Bram has gone to the Fire Islands, down into the volcano where Primordis is lying. Bram, along with the Spirits of the Wild, merged together and went into the lava to become Primordis' champion in hopes of steering the Elder Dragon of Fire to attack Jormag. It eventually works, which leads to an epic encounter where Primordis, his destroyers, and his champion Bram face off against Jormag, her Ice Brood, and her champion Ryland. We show up with Orin and our allies to make sure that both sides lose equally, and neither gets the upper hand. This leads to the second coolest cutscene in Guild Wars 2, and I will play that for you now. Yeah, that's right. The two Elder Dragons literally destroy each other, and Orin absorbs both of their magical energies at the same time. With their dragons destroyed, both Bram and Ryland are returned to their normal, uncorrupted states. Bram is shirtless and he's fine. Ryland, on the other hand, is furious and fighting his mother and father. A final fight ensues, and it's you, Ritlock, and Cretia versus Ryland. After we go in and beat this kitty cat's tail, he goes for a desperate lunge at Cretia to stab her, and Ritlock steps in and plunges his sword through Ryland, killing his own son. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where our story leaves off. We have killed Zaitan, the Elder Dragon of Death, Scarlet Briar, a ginger tree, Mordremoth, the Elder Dragon of Plants, Lord Cauticus, the leader of the White Mantle. Balthazar, the literal god of war. Palawa Joko, the undead lich king of Alona. Kralkatoric, the elder dragon of purple crystals. 
Primordus, the Elder Dragon of Fire, and Jormag, the Elder Dragon of Ice. We are also the champion of the new Elder Dragon, Orin. And finally, Ritlock and Kreisha are going to need years of therapy to deal with this whole Rylan thing. I hope you guys enjoyed my Guild Wars 2 story summary. Let me know in the comments what's your favorite moments been in the story over the past 10 years. And as always, everybody, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. And I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.